The nine patch quilt block is another one of those foundational quilt blocks for all of us quilters, but there's more than one way to skin this quilted cat. Let's get started. And welcome back everybody to another foundation style video, even though we're not doing foundation anyways. I am Rob Appel, your host here at Making It Fun. I am from Michael Miller Fabrics, and I couldn't be more blessed to see all of you out there joining me today. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, whatever it was, we posted a video that was called Log Cabin 411. My goodness, the reaction has been incredible, and thank you to all of you out there who have viewed it, subscribed, uh, watched it, shared it, uh, all of that. It's been huge and super fun, but what it really told me was that you all love these basics videos, not only using our beautiful basics fabrics from Michael Miller, but how do we create some of the most simple quilt blocks because I truly believe if you know how the rules are meant to be, we know how to break them, AKA be way more creative and do all kinds of different crazy things. So this week's video is all about the traditional methods of the nine patch block. It is a super simple project, super simple square, but if you stick with me, I will teach you a couple of tricks to maybe get some accuracy in your points if that's important to you. Uh, I could see I could use a little accuracy in my hair combing. Uh, there, that's a little bit better <laughs> as well. I noticed it as you go running in here. So anyways, we are gonna have a lot of fun today and I'm just gonna dive right into the instructions here. Uh, you're seeing some of our beautiful cotton couture and our fairy frost. I'll also add in the hash dot to make some other colors. We're gonna actually expand this out because let's just, slow down a little bit. I know it's hard for me. I'm always so caffeinated. The nine patch block, as you can see, it's basically a high contrast. That really helps us see the individual blocks. But if you do something like this with just two colors, when it's all done by the use of our awesome magic design wall, I can show you this square right here will be a giant checkerboard. So awesome, and actually the picture I just showed you that I synthetically put together by the one square using the Instagram layouts and the magic design wall, of course. That's even more interesting than the quilt would be because you can see the light wasn't perfect on the block and therefore you can see there's some bright and dark spots, but it wouldn't really read that way. It would be a very flat, two-dimensional, two-color quilt, checkerboard style. So if you wanna make a checkerboard quilt, the basic instructions are this. Make a two-color nine patch and make lots of those and put them together. Done, easy. Now, what I want to discuss, though, like I said, is some of the traditional information, the beginning information. So a nine patch was originally created with nine individual patches, squares, often cut from maybe old shirt tails or the bottom of a scrap of something, maybe a feed sack, I don't know. Wasn't the beautiful fairy frosting cotton couture, I'll tell you that. Anyways, so what happens is you're gonna have five of one color, four of another, and a lot of times we make blocks that are obviously opposites of each other so we can put them back together and make them make that checkerboard effect. So I will be integrating two new colors and that will make our quilt by the end of this video way more interesting in my humble opinion but I wanted to talk about how we build these blocks traditionally. So originally it was done, or if you're working from scraps, you just wanna make sure that every square is the same size. In this video, I happen to be working with three and a half inches because it was mostly easy to work out of my half yards I was working with. The squares are also large enough that it makes sense while sewing. It helps with the accuracy a little bit. And I can make a couple of squares and make a quilt in a hurry using a three and a half or larger size because the pieces are so big, we have less seam allowances, right? Okay, so anyways, normally speaking, layout would be um, checkerboard. I think we've gone over that several times, Rob. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> which is this, right? Boom, checkerboard. So if you're dealing with squares, scraps, your stash, you're going to pre-cut everything down into the same size square, and then you're gonna sew them together. And doing that, I'm just gonna grab one square at a time. I'm gonna come over to my quarter inch seam allowance, lower my presser foot, and I'm gonna go ahead and sew. So I do have a edge guide on this particular foot, and it is going to help me keep all of my pieces accurately sewn together so that none of the combinations are bigger or smaller than the rest. 
I just use those two. I can grab these two. If you're brand new to quilting, what I'm now doing is called chain piecing. I'm doing a chain like sausages of little quilt squares. And I'm just gonna sew these together uh, two by two as I go. And then we'll have to reset and do it again. So what I'm trying to also point out, and I'm gonna talk while I sew, so you can see that sewing squares together isn't necessarily not efficient. So it can be pretty dang quick. But the disadvantage is, is it can be a little more sloppy than the other way of doing it, which I'll show you here in a second. But let's finish this part first, in case some of you really only have a pile of squares. Maybe you are a charm packs collector, and you wanna know what do I do with all of these five and a half inch packs of squares, or these, five, excuse me, five inch squares, or sometimes I think they come threes now, whatever. Go, changing mental directions here. Let's get back to the project at hand. See what I just did? What I want you to do is choose a color and always press to that color. So for me, uh, in the original setup, I was saying in my brain, because I've got some pink colors throughout the project, press to the pink, press to the pink. It's easy for me to remember. So even though this isn't actually a pink color, it's of the pink family. So for all of these little squares, regardless of where they were in the design, at the moment, I'm just pressing to the pink. Now, if you're a more experienced quilter, you're probably thinking to yourself, I know what he's doing here. He's setting the seam allowances so that later, when he puts them together, the seam allowances are all going in different directions, which makes things so easy. So by pressing to the pink, we're gonna create these nested seams when we get there to put our columns back together. That's why that's important. You've also heard folks say, press to the dark side, press to the dark side. Well, that's also important as well. Now, I have to be careful to make sure that I'm not talking while doing this too much. I need to make sure I get them back together in their combos. And remember, the combos aren't exactly the same. Now I'm making sure that I have the two pieces on the feed dogs, the one new piece being added on, and still able to chain piece, saving time and thread. But you can also get yourself painted into a little bit of a corner if you grab the wrong square at the wrong time. So do pay attention to what you're doing. And if you're timing me on the clock, you can see we've almost built this whole square in just a few short conversations here, okay? One of the keys to that accuracy is really taking the time to press after each seam. So again, pressing to the pink, holding that pink up in the air. So this one here being an edge piece, as I pointed out a moment ago, the seams are going out. This pink here is now in the center. So I'm gonna again, flip it over and press it so the seam goes into the pink. And when that happens now, you can see that those seam allowances on the back side of the project, I wanna burn hole. The back side of the project are actually going to nest together beautifully, and that really helps with the accuracy, but it's also why I chose three and a half inches. The bigger the piece of fabric, the more give you have in the stretch or the flex of the grain, the wharf, the wep, all of that. So that being said, we can use the size to our advantage if we need to encourage any of these seam points to match up, because that's what we're gonna kind of be looking for in this particular project. I keep talking about nesting. I'm gonna flip this over and try to hold it still so you can really see that I have now massaged with my fingers those pieces together until that seam is really parked up against itself like that. And then as I get over to the sewing machine, we're gonna go ahead and just press this here. Once I have gotten through the first union of seams, I'm gonna go ahead and check the next union. So I'm looking down here, I'm pinching down here. You might wanna put a straight pin down there. Now at this moment, it's your option. You could return to the iron and press, and that's probably the best route, but we will have enough room we can do it. If you wanna just take a moment and make sure that you Get your orientation correct, grab that piece, nest those seams right back up, and you can see it's kind of like a wiggle. You kind of just wiggle those together and they just lock in so nice. And then I come over here, and I'm really only worried about that first needle drop, and then if I need to reorganize, I can. Over the first union, so now I'm recalibrating for the second union. I have just enough flex in the fabric. If I had to give a little tug, 
or a little pinch to make it all come together perfectly, it wouldn't affect it. It would never show up in the quilt because it's just a little freckle there. Let's get this freed up from the sewing machine, hit it with the iron and show you how simple that was. Now for this block here, I'm just gonna press in one direction. If you always wanted to try to press towards the inside or outside, it may make a difference, but then you'd have to organize the checkerboards onto the wall. Fabric's not gonna get in the way that much. It's just a nice trick if you're actually doing those nested seams. So what I really, really am excited to point out is yes, it came out pretty nice. It was fairly efficient. And if you're using lots of different fabrics, that's awesome. But if you do want to make a two or maybe a four or a six color project using the nine patches, your base design, it's much easier to take those three and a half squares. And before you take the strips that were cut three and a half, don't cut them into squares yet. Now the trick is, let me show you the working pieces. This was done from the squares. You watched me do it. I have not moved that square. This was done from these strips. So what I did is I made two different, they have to be different, strip set rows, right? So you can see the pinks in the middle of uh, this one <laughs> and is on the sides of the other, okay? So what you do is you take your 45 inch goods by however wide you want your squares to be. So these strips are three and a half inch strips. We're gonna make the opposite. This is gonna be my new color we're gonna add in and you can see what that's gonna do for all of this design. So let me show you how that works, okay? Moving into the stripped piece, awesome format here. So this is, like I said, the other one. Now let's make one together. I've got a couple points I'll point out, tips I'll point out to you, something like that. So our turquoise, um, our wonderful hash dot is in the middle there. So you can see now it will be on either side of our grape colored cotton couture here. Beautiful. So again, I'm just gonna take one and I'm gonna flop it over like this. Now, what you're looking at right now is pieces number one and piece number two. And if I go to the sewing machine like this, it's gonna make it harder to make all of the edges line up on one edge like this. Now, why would I want that to happen though? Because I wanna cut off the very slightest amount before I sub cut these back into the three and a half inch wide strips to make them work. So we're all about efficiency. We're all about reducing waste. One of my number one tricks is, and this is not what my grandmother wants me to tell you. I, I'm sorry, Grandma. Grandma always stitched up one side and down the other, up one side and down the other. And I just, maybe it's the feed dogs are better, the threads better, but really, if you're taking a nice, slow pace, a good stitch, and you have a quality sewing machine, you really should be able to sew all your fabrics in one direction. And I'm not really willing to debate that with any of you, so don't bother writing it in the comments. Here's my trick to make it make sense. If this was piece one, I want to start by sewing looking at piece number two. Stay with me. Coming to the quarter inch, dropping the presser foot, and right now, I'm literally just making sure both edges of the fabric are lined up. And even though I really wanna to get to the end of these 45 inches, the first thing I'm not doing is sewing past about medium speed. Because I don't wanna stretch the fabrics. You'll also notice with my hands, I'm not pushing and I'm not pulling these strips. I love strip piecing. And it, it makes quilt layout, especially these, um, what do I want to say? Uh, redundant, symmetrically pieced blocks. You can do millions and millions of strips. It ends up with 100 million squares in no time flat. It's wonderful. But we need to not rush any of the steps. So I'm not gonna rush this step. I'm just gonna slowly, with that quarter inch and the seam allowance, I'm just gonna sew on through. And really just steering back here with these back hand. If I see my fabric's getting a little mislined, I'll take the time, I'll reorganize. Now, a lot of times I'll also drop my stitch length. Right now it's at a 2.2 millimeter. A lot of our machines have a 2.5 millimeter. Um, you could go as low as a 2.0 if you would like. Now, the reason I do that, the shorter the stitch, the less the movement of the fabric per stitch. And if you were getting some sort of uh, distortion in your seams, that could be a major problem. But really the answer is, Clean your sewing machines. If you'll keep the lint out from underneath the feed dogs, underneath the presser foot and all of that stuff, the feed dogs will come all the way up and they'll travel with your fabric all the better. So really keeping your feed dogs nice and lint free uh, will really help if nothing else. Now, 
back to what we were doing, making a mess on the set, of course. We do need to press this one before we add on the next strip because I just want it to be really crisp and accurate. So earlier we were pressing to the pink, well pink and purple rhyme, so we're going to press to the purple now, okay? That's what, that's what we do. Sometimes it's dark versus light, but a lot of times it's just what makes the most sense. So I'm going to lay it right sides together, purple's up in the air. I'm going to take my iron on this nice long ironing board. And I'm just going to start to run it in there. And effectively, I'm setting the seam right now against that thread. Just pushing that up against there. Easy. Looking for any areas there might be really waffling or warping. Maybe the seam didn't press over correct and it's funky on the back. Okay. A little light steam if you wanted to. Then let it cool. Let it just chill for a few moments so that the um, fabric has its memory, you know, and it wants to be in the state it was when it was last cool. So we're going to let it hang out there for a second. And now, back to the first point I was making on the strips, I was stitching looking at piece number two. So as I rotate this around to add on piece number three, you can see that I have a really wonderful, nice cleaned up line here, which will be the first place we start with the rotary cutter. So we can cut off as little as possible. So maybe when you rotate that around, you even want to choose a different selvage. Now, I'm going to cut off even the little holes, but maybe one side's different than the other, so I do try to take the time to line them all up. So I'm going to flip it over again, and so the point I really wanted you to learn is if you're always looking at the next piece at the needle when you're sewing it on, we can build out lots and lots of strip sets and have the bulk of the material get away from the needle of the machine while we keep adding on our strips at the top, and that way we don't have to go down one side and back up the other, down one side and back up the other. Some of my patterns don't leave a lot of excess when I'm done. And if you're going up one side and down the other, you may be actually having to trim off inches because, I mean, even the best of manufacturers use many a different mills. And so 45 inches, I think you'll all agree, is no longer 45 inches. It's close. But even our solids, because of the way they're made, different than the prints that, you know, they're not always going to be exactly the same length. Pick up the pace a little here, but we're not going crazy. We're just going to finish out this strip set. As I head into the ironing board over here, uh, just a quick reminder, we're doing two strip sets of each. So technically I had three strips, three and a half inches by the length of the goods. Now I'm pressing again into the purple by holding the blue and purple up in the air, letting that seam catch and falling over on top of it with the iron like that. Okay, so this whole strip set has the same nesting of seams concept built into the strip set that we did when we were doing the squares as well. So all we're doing is really sewing a bunch of squares together in a long, long rectangle first, and now we're going to cut these bad boys into squares. Okay, and we'll still even have equal parts when we're done, if you kind of handle it the way I do. I just need to make a little bit more space. Does anybody at home have a sewing room that's not quite big enough? That's what I want to hear in the comments from you today below. How many of you do not have enough space in your sewing room and why? There's your challenge question. Why don't you have enough room in your sewing room, no matter how big it is? Okay, back to the work. And again, thank you for always being here and having fun with me. I'm going to square off. I'm going to trim up. So I'm now taking a lot of focus time to look at the lines on my ruler that are actually running perpendicular to that edge, coming in here, making sure none of the little pinholes are included. Off it goes, and I have a super clean line, and we are ready to start cutting. Let's go ahead and rotate, making it easy on our body. And what I want to do now is I'm going to subcut these strips at whatever width they were to begin with. Maybe I should call these columns. I don't hope that wasn't confusing. But so remember, they were three and a half inches long. Now they're going to be three and a half inch columns to maintain the squares we actually are creating in our patchwork. 
I really want you to focus on all three lines now. I want you to focus on the edge along the printed line. I want you to focus on the lines on the ruler as I move them there. <laughs> Let's do that again. So I want to focus on all of those lines, sides, top, cut, and just push it right. And we're going to make two different piles. Now, hopefully it goes without saying, but with the second colored strip set, we're gonna do the exact same thing to it. Um, you can see I need to trim off this edge still, and I'm not very left-handed, but it can be done. But do what's most comfortable for you. Line up those seam allowances. If you're cutting on your non-dominant hand, put a ton of pressure down on the ruler so nothing moves, because everything's gonna feel awkward. Make yourself a nice, safe cut that way practice. It does come in handy. And now I'm going to go back to my three and a half inch marks and I'm going to blast these out as well as I cut through. And as a matter of fact, I only need technically three of them to show you what we need to do next. So I'll come back to that later when you're not looking. And the reason I said we need three of them is I wanted to show you in case you were concerned about do you have equal parts, you really do because with each block we make, we're flipping and flopping the quantities. So from the two turquoise, I've used two with one from the two purples. But then the next one I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use two from the two purples, obviously, and make it for one of the turquoise. So as you're building off of your strip sets, instead of using the squares, I think the most important thing to keep in mind is just make sure you make equal piles so that when we're all done, we have the same quantity so we can put them back together. We will still be playing within the concepts of lights and darks, or maybe you would like to see this as prints and solids, prints and solids. So you can see we can still get the checkerboard effect, but adding in more and more colors to add more and more interest to our nine patch. Make sense? So with these built now, it's just the same as when I was done with the squares. We have awesome nested seams because we pressed to the same color over and over again, regardless of where it was at in the strip set rows. So to put these together, the same thing, I'm just gonna flip them, flop them, <laughs> drag them to the machine and get these bad boys nicely together here. Of course, if you're into chain piecing and you had done all the pre-cutting, it's really, really easy because you start with one combo, right? You just start with one of each of each of the strip sets. And then at the end, you mix and match with everything that's left over, making sure that you make, we'll call them darks and lights or lefts and rights, whatever you want to call them. But that way you do again, end up with equal opposite parts. Very easy. So you can see why, in my opinion now, the strip set method over the square by square method, if you have the opportunity, so you've got good long yardage instead of a bunch of scraps of squares, is not only more efficient, but I feel like it's a lot more accurate. If you'll take the time to sew together and press each time and nest those seams, either way, you're gonna get some pretty nice points in there and it will look pretty dang sharp as we get ready to put it up on the design wall. Now, this is just the beginning of where we are with the nine patch. There's many of things we can do within the nine patch. I want to stop for a moment and talk about utilizing the magic design wall that we have. And if you haven't seen this trick before, we have the Instagram layout. So it's an independent app that you get in any of your app stores, but it's under Instagram layout. And what you do is you take a single picture with your cell phone and then you can tile it. And that gives you a really cool way of making multiple blocks. But within the layouts tricks, you can actually flip some of your blocks so you can make 
New blocks, it would be mirror images. So then when you create more blocks, you know what you need. It's great for calculations and stuff. So you can see what's going to happen as we start to float these back together into the magic design wall with the two colors, what that's going to really, really do. Now, in order to make it super impressive, I am going to take the time to sew all of these strips into square. So in just a few short moments, you'll see what that looks like. But I want to point out what is a new quick variable, but it's still pretty traditional. So we're not saving this for next week. Next week, next video, I should say, is going to be crazy what we do with these. But this, just, I'll be right back. I'm just kind of, it's kind of. So. Down from the magic cabinet, if we got a magic design wall, you gotta have a magic cabinet. I wanna point out some of these crazy strips I made because they can make some of these crazy kinds of blocks. Now, if you look closely, you can see that it's like mostly one combo and a little of the other. But what this can do for traveling color through in and out of our project can be really, really cool. So what I did is I just made, um, several different strip sets where I chose three different colors. And then as I put them back together, I tried to keep color families on the same sides of the squares. For the most part, I was able to keep them all prints and solids, prints and solids. But you can see even with this square here, I got one where it was solids and prints and it doesn't affect it negatively on the design wall. It adds one of those, what we would call a maverick block, something of extra interest to look for in the quilt itself. So now I just wanted to point out everything was done the same, but these extra unique combo squares will also be included on the magic design wall with the all purple and the all orange and pink squares. We'll put those together and make a really terrific layout, which is still nine patch, but it's not just a checkerboard. Another way you could avoid that checkerboard only appearance or look when using a two color fabric or even a four color fabric in the nine patch is to add in what we call sashing and or cornerstones. Now sashing is the name of the strips that go between the blocks, uh, be going like right through here and a cornerstone would fit right in between at the union of the sashings. Something like this, I'm going to encourage you to use a different size sashing strip than we did in our strips or our squares. So if those are three and a half, I'm going to probably choose something like a one and a half to two inch sashing and or cornerstone. So it really affects the appearance of the quilt differently. If you want to use the magic design wall trick in the Instagram layouts, what you simply do is find a couple of squares that are going to work well together. So let me bring this one down here and move this for now. And what I'm going to do is I put this together and I say works well together because I'm still looking at having my print next to my solid, my print next to my solid. But now you can see I've actually auditioning in. Now you could put the real color fabric you wanted, but I'm just gonna use the solid color of the design wall. You can see I'm assuming a roughly a one inch strip would fit in there. So when I photograph that, now I also wanna go ahead and make sure that I'll add in the other square so that I make myself a complete checkerboard square with all four colors. And I'll show you that here in just a second as well. See, pretty impressive the way that looks, doesn't it? So now that you're getting a hang of the actual design wall tricks and the color layouts, that's where we can start to have some fun and put these back together as well. At the moment, my sewing room is probably looking a lot more like your sewing room today, and I've got nothing but strips and squares and parts and pieces everywhere. So what I'm gonna do is just take a moment and put all of these squares back together so we can play with a few more layout ideas using the traditional two color blocks wherever they went and some of these other fun three color blocks to go together and make a really radical nine patch. So. Thanks for sticking with me, folks. Let me put these pieces together and I'll be right back to finish up on the design wall. So it didn't take long to create all of the blocks that you now see on the table, but let me point out, because I didn't give you great supplies earlier. I want to remind you that the nine patch blocks that you now see, they are finishing right now nine and a half by nine and a half, in case you want that for your calculations. They are using three and a half inch squares, but if you were watching the entire video, you saw that I did most of these with using three and a half 
by the 45 inch long strips. So there was three strips made in each strip set. There were three strips from each color of the two different colors. When I was done with both strip sets, I was able to yield eight of these nine and a half inch squares, four from each of the family. So we can build a really cool checkerboard this way. And as a reminder, um, I've now stacked and organized all of my fabrics before, well, almost all of them, before we go over to the design wall here. And um, I have the four different piles of the very, very traditional checkerboard style nine patch squares. And then I also have my wonky randoms. Excuse me, they're only randoms. They're not wonky. These are still straight piece, straight cuts. But you can see we've got a variety in here. There. Now, I think you get a little bit better impression of what I was trying to explain, which is kind of that modern quilt feel with a very traditional approach and a very traditional block. So it was the random blocks that went up in there that kind of changed the whole effect. So hopefully today, as we're wrapping up the video, you have learned that what you can do with a basic nine patch is of course, burn up all of those scraps. Using those squares, just take the time to press your fabrics nice, cut them into squares and just build and build and build, but remembering to play off of the contrast. The light against the dark or the print versus the solid something like that so that every square can be seen in the project. That's really important and I don't believe I pointed that out early on. So I'm glad you stuck around till the end of the video. Secondly, uh, with a project like this, you can do an easy checkerboard. You could add in some sashings to add in some interest, some cornerstones, even more. I wanted you to make sure you picked up on the difference between the strip piecing and the squares piecing. It's the same finish, but just a little bit more efficient and a little more accurate because you're cutting across multiple strips instead of all of those little squares handling them at the sewing machine. And I really like that technique. You know, it's, it's kind of fun. I, I like to consider myself a bit innovative. I consider myself a bit of a maker, you know, in, in the garage and stuff on the weekends. And, and so I can only imagine those first quilter. So I said this isn't our grandmother's technique, but I can only imagine when grandmother was out there realizing moving from the scissors and the individual cut squares to the rotary cutter style and then the strip style and the mass production style because we all love to make quilts so much we just can't stop making them. And so that's what I really wanted to portray today with this video. Give you some information if you've been learning some of the very basics. Hopefully you learned a bunch more. Now, I'm not going to sew these blocks together because I have a whole other idea that I want to integrate to make it to the next level. So, I will see you in the next video on the nine patch where we're going to take it to the next step. We might even add a little bit of fire and see if we can't make one of those bad boys blow up, if you know what I mean. So, I'll see you real soon. Thanks for being here. Enjoy all of your work with the nine patch and the basic blocks. We'll see you on another great episode at Making It Fun. Wow, you are still there. Thanks for sticking with me till the end of the video. <laughs> I know, I get a little long-winded sometimes. But if you did enjoy today's video, make sure you check out a few of the other ones we've created. I think they're terrific. And of course, please subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit the little bell to be notified. I don't want you to miss a moment of the fun. Stay safe and happy sewing.